So, a uh, real honor to be here and uh, see you all here in a sunny San Francisco morning. So, my name is James Pierce and I'm from Facebook. And uh, relishing the opportunity to tell you a little bit about where we think HTML5 is, uh, some of the challenges we've faced, and some of the things that we think both companies like ourselves, but also the community uh, of people like yourselves can help make HTML5 the reality or the, you know, the instantiation of the dream that we hope it all will be. Um, so that's me. Uh, I work at Facebook. I work on developer relations. That said, my background and my speciality is uh, JavaScript and mobile. And uh, so I've kind of been working with some of this stuff for a little while. I've been on the ups and I've been on the downs. Uh, one of the exciting things about being at Facebook is that I get to see what it's really like to try and use this stuff at scale. And I can share some of those insights with you, perhaps. So uh, back in 1997, uh, when I was a wee lad, um, I saw my first mobile web browser. It was a, a, a browser, a WAP browser, that was running on an unwired, uh, unwired planet platform on a Palm 3 device. And uh, it was a pretty miserable experience. It was pretty hacky. I mean, it wasn't even really the web. So WAP was this kind of bastardized version of, of the web. It used its own markup language, and it even used its own binary version of HTTP. Um, but it was extremely exciting. And you know, I was wide-eyed, and everyone was in awe of what the web was going to become in the mid-'90s anyway. Uh, but the thought that there was now a browser running on a device like this that I could pick up and put in my pocket and take with me wherever I went was pretty amazing. Uh, I think everybody that kind of got a glimpse of what the future mobile web would look like uh, could see that there was this huge opportunity. Uh, the web already was going to escape from the desktop world, and this was only 1997. And I think we all thought that the, there would be this incredible mobile future, and it would happen really, really quickly, that we'd see this kind of global web that sort of mapped across the globe that you know, went with us wherever we went. It wasn't just on our desks. We could get up and move around. You know? That there was going to be a, uh, a global village of billions of people around the world all connected and all talking to each other and communicating via this amazing mobile medium. Um, and it was going to quickly lift us out of this desktop age that we lived in uh, in 1997. Um, and create a medium where, you know, when a child smiled for the first time, you could take a photo of it and, and share it with your friends, and you know, where you could check in at a dinner that you were having in some you know, amazing restaurant, or you know, where serendipity could be instantiated by just hanging out on a street corner and finding out where your friends were, all through the magic of this mobile device. And when we thought about this future, we thought, you know, th this is going to be incredible. This web is going to be an amazing medium that'll be innovative, it'll be disruptive, it'll be beautiful, it'll be with us everywhere, it'll be, uh, you know, an intimate part of our lives. Uh, so I thought this was going to take about six months back in 1997. I thought, well, this won't take very long. I'm sure we can, you know, pull this off. There's the browser. We've got people writing content. How hard can it be? Okay. 13, 14, 15 years later, we're finally starting to see uh, this reality come to life. Uh, my timing sucks. But um, it is, I think, uh, interesting to think about how we thought this was going to happen. We thought it was going to be the web that made this happen. We thought that the web was going to be the medium that would bring this mobile dream to life. Um, by the way, this isn't, I, know, I know this isn't a mobile conference, and this isn't even a particularly mobile talk, but I should just preface it by saying that I will be talking exclusively about mobile. I will not be talking about desktops. That's just the world I think we now live in. We have left the desktop age. So apologies that I'm not going to talk about desktop browsers. Um, so this is what I thought we would get to, and we have gotten there. But the point is that it's not the web that's gotten us there. The innovation, the beauty, the disruption that's happening in mobile uh, it's not the web. It's all happening here. It's all happening on the native platforms. I'm sorry to say that is still the truth. Um, and at Facebook, you know, we get to work with native platforms. We get to work with partners, and we get to work with developers who are building uh, iOS apps and Android apps just as much as they're building mobile web apps. So you know, we can see both sides of the argument, and we know what people are doing. But quite frankly, this is where, and let's be honest, the cool stuff kind of is happening. Um, and in case you think I am just uh, speaking heresy here, uh, just think to yourself, look at your phone. How many you know, amazing, beautiful, innovative, disruptive native apps do you have running on your phone? How many of them can you name? You, know, you can go on and on and on, whether it's Path, Pinterest, Clear, Cut the Rope, 
you know, WordLens, Spotify, bang, bang, bang. You can just keep naming native apps and before you even left the first page of your home screen. But if I cross out the word native and I replace it with web, how many innovative, beautiful, and disruptive web apps can you name? Ah, OK. Well, there's Gmail. That's pretty cool. There is uh, the Financial Times and Boston Globe. And you know that list gets short quite quickly. And so it's, it's just this place that we are right now that the web hasn't become the medium for this innovation and this disruption uh, that is happening in mobile right now. The web is not where we thought it would be. We are on the back foot. We're in catch-up mode. And frankly, the stack as a whole is a little bit out of its depth. This is tough competition. Um, and uh, the web needs to get a bit of its mojo back. Uh, if you believe Wired Magazine, of course, the web is actually totally dead. Uh, and in fact, has been for several years. But what I think Wired was talking about when they said that the web was dead, and implicitly HTML5, uh, was, I think, inspired by one very particular moment, which was in the summer of 2007. In the summer of 2007, Steve Jobs announced the iPhone. And for quite a long time, the only way you could build third-party apps for the iPhone was in the web browser, was using HTML5, JavaScript, CSS3, and some strange viewport tags that no one had ever seen before. That was how you created apps. As a web community, we had that opportunity. Steve gave us a year to prove that we had what it took to make the web the first class runtime for this new mobile age. And somehow, it did not happen. I don't know whether it was our fault. I don't know whether it was Apple's fault. But somehow, we had that window of opportunity, and we missed it. We're departing the desktop age. We're joining the mobile age. And the web didn't jump the divide quick enough, somehow. Um, and uh, of course, the rest is history, so to speak. And it's now, although the web is marching forward slowly on platforms like uh, Apple, um, it's remarkably difficult to make competitive apps. So why is that? Well, I mean, I look at us a little bit uh, through kind of a cultural lens, and I say, well, as a community, maybe we just got hung up on the wrong things. You know, we got hung up on pinching and zooming, and oh, what, this, we don't need to build special mobile apps. We don't need to build special stuff. We just go to our regular sites, and we pinch and zoom. The browser will take care of it. You know, we argued about one web and how you know you couldn't possibly have a different experience for different devices. That would be, you know, Tim Berners-Lee would, uh, you know, would crucify us. You know, we uh, worried about thematic consistency, making sure we had the same services regardless of the type of browser that we used. We worried about alternative contexts, whether they really exist or not. Should we give different things to people when they're on a train versus, you know, at their desktop? Um, we worried about fragmentation. We worried about uh, server-side adaptation, client-side adaptation, proprietary prefixes. We worried about uh, you know, all of this stuff, digital divides, feature detection, graceful degradation, progressive enhancement. We are, it seems, a community of philosophers, because we spend a lot of our time talking about these high-level abstract things, and we forget to actually write software. Um, and then we come out with things like this. We say, oh, but don't worry. The web will always win. Don't worry about that native stuff. It's just a fad. The web will always win. How many times have you heard people say things like this? Maybe even I've said something like this. I don't know. I'm probably guilty of that. But this is not necessarily a logical argument. This is not necessarily an axiom. We have no empirical evidence to prove that the web will win in the long term, do we? Of course not. So underpinning this is this kind of conceitedness that we as a community, I'm going to feel a bit guilty saying this, arguably we have. We think that the web is going to become inexorably successful. And we just have to sit back and wait for it to happen. Um, so true believers take the web to be this sort of inevitable disruptive force, uh, and that these new platforms are merely just a short-term fad. Um, a little bit like the TV. So uh, experienced broadcasting executive Daryl Zanuck in 1946 said, television won't be able to hold on to any market it captures in the first six months, because people will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box. So what happens is that generally new technologies overlay previous ones. They don't make them obsolete. You know, the TV didn't make the radio obsolete. Uh, but new technologies rarely give up and just disappear and revert us all back to where we were five years ago. So we can't look at native platforms and assume that it's going to go away. I have no reason to believe that native mobile platforms are going anywhere fast. And you know, our best use case or best hope is that we can use native platforms as an inspiration for making the web a better place. 
Uh, and the worst case scenario is that we don't, and the web takes an ever more niche role as being just where you go and look at read-only documents. Uh, so whilst we're on quotes, here is another quote from a relatively well-known web developer. When I'm introspective about the last few years, I think the biggest mistake that we made as a company was betting too much on HTML5 as opposed to native, because it just wasn't there. Thanks, Mark. You just ruined my developer relations year. But this is a quote that is born out of frustration. This is our CEO who has obviously been a relentless backer of HTML5 and web technologies as a platform to help drive you know, the Facebook um, product onwards. <clears throat> and yet he is prepared to stand up in a very public environment and say, look, it just hasn't worked for us as a company. Um, he is obviously uh, making that, con uh, that, that quote in a very specific context. Um, and you know, that context is the Facebook application itself. So we had a, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we had a Facebook native, quote, native application uh, until the summer, which was version four, not that anyone knew that, uh, which was uh, the personification of the hybrid concepts. We had you know, a native wrapper around the outside, uh, the UI at the top, and a few of the menus were native. But more or less, you know, 80 or 90% of the screen at any given time was an HTML5 web view. And you were seeing literally HTML uh, that had been shipped across the wire and displayed. So whether you were looking at a Facebook timeline or a news feed or uh, you know, uh, your settings or group lists or whatever, you were basically looking at HTML5. And you know, if you think about where we were as a company, that made a lot of sense when we started to build out this architecture. Web company, pure web company. You know, Facebook has always been on the web. It is a child of the web uh, era. Um, and we had a pretty awesome uh, collection of very talented web developers. So it was a natural choice to try to create the Facebook experience using web technologies. Uh, it allowed us to launch new features very quickly without going and getting Apple's permission every time. And it allowed us to reuse a lot of the mobile web code that we had anyway. And if you ever went to you know, m.facebook.com or you got sent to m.facebook.com, inside the frame you got literally pixel by pixel uh, equivalent uh, experience. Um, and you would think that actually this would be a classic, or this would be a wonderful example of a, a, a good app that could be hybridized like this. Because, you know, let's face it, it's just a list of text and a few images and a few borders, right? Um, well, sadly not. It turns out that the Facebook timeline and the Facebook profile, newsfeed and so forth, are actually remarkably complex. You know, they're extremely image laden. Uh, they are uh, infinitely long, ultimately, so users expect to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. You know, every single story in that news feed has interaction. There are like buttons, there are inline comment buttons, um, and uh, obviously users expect a certain amount of decoration too, a little bit of gradients, a little bit of shadows, and you know, they just expect some texture on there. So even though on paper this is a fairly straightforward user interface, uh, it, it's actually remarkably complex. It's a fairly heavy DOM. Uh, I'm sure we could have done more to reduce the size of the DOM, but it's, it's fairly heavy. And frankly, the device, even a 4S with you know, fantastic GPU, was just struggling to scroll stuff. And users, they just expect to flick, 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 an infinite list of their friends' status updates. And sadly enough, mobile web browsers simply could not keep up with it. So. Um, we had to make a switch. And uh, version 5 of the Facebook app, although it looks indistinguishable, is now far, far more native. Um, and in fact, one of our engineers did actually go into Xcode and do file new project and started from scratch. Um, there are still some HTML5 elements inside there, uh, but not the primary views, which are now all rendered natively. And you know, as technologists, we're interested in why we did this and, and how we did this. But from a user's point of view, they couldn't care less. They don't know that we've built it one way versus another. What they do know is that it's now twice as fast. And what we know about what they know is that now they're visiting twice as much content as they used to do. So for us as a company, we've won, you know, uh, an important battle here, which is to get our users to look at our application more and use content more. So was it worth, you know, uh, losing half of our content consumption uh, based on technological dogma? Well, no. At the end of the day, Facebook is a product company. We need to produce the best and highest possible quality products, as I think you all do. And we made a choice on this particular product 
to increase the amount of native uh, code and give our users a better experience. Now, that is not to say that we you know, mandate that everybody else does this. We expect every, each and every engineering company everywhere around the world to be able to make their own decisions. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's, the, 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 the step change that we've seen as a result has been dramatic, I'm sorry to say. You know, our rating on the App Store went from one and a half stars to four in three weeks. You know, what product managers does not want to see their product being more than twice as well rated within three weeks? That's what we got by switching away from a hybrid view. I'm sorry. So you think that what I'm trying to say is that building native apps uh, from you know, hybrid views like this is dead. Well, you know, of course not. You know, our challenges are not the same as yours. Uh, well, they may be. Uh, but we can't guarantee that you've got the same decision tree to go down as the decision tree that our product team had to go down. You know, we have a very complicated site. We have an awful lot of content. We have quite a lot of users. And we need to quickly uh, and uh, you know, at a very high quality meet their expectations. We also have a rather large engineering organization. It was a lot of effort, a huge amount of effort, for Facebook to retool around iOS. We had to go and hire iOS developers. We had to build a whole new tool chain. We had to create a whole load of new server APIs to deliver content to this application. It was extremely hard. It was extremely painful to do it. Um, but you know, from a product point of view, the rewards have been worth it. Not every company is able to make those kinds of decisions. But you know, we're still not saying that HTML5 is dead. And in fact, if you listen carefully to what Mark said, the rest of his quote, which conveniently didn't get recorded by much of the tech press, was this. It's not that HTML5 is bad. You know, actually, in the long term, I'm quite excited about it. I'm trying to channel Mark here. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that we actually have more people on a daily basis using Facebook on the mobile web than we do on iOS or Android combined. And in fact, that's true. These are our iOS and Android apps in terms of monthly active users, and our mobile web app, which is twice either of them, more than both of them combined. So yes, we don't put numbers on the left-hand side of this graph, but I can assure you we have 600 million mobile users. This is a statistically significant sample of how people use our services. And really, you know, the mobile web, HTML5, remains pretty much the only way that we can reliably deliver a rich and compelling experience to 7,000 different types of devices a day. Not all of our users have an iPhone, and not all of our users have an Android device. We still have to serve content to many, many other types of devices. And in fact, even iPhone and Android users you know, continue to use our mobile web aggressively. Um, and as I said, inside the app, there are still lots of HTML5 views. So we have not forsaken it. Uh, we've just switched out the bits that really mattered. Something else that's interesting is that in order to do this, in order to increase the native mix on our device, we've had to do a lot more rendering on the client side. So previously, a lot of the views that you saw in that hybrid app were actually being generated as HTML on the, on the, on the server side, because they were coming out of the same code base as www.facebook.com. Uh, one of the things that this native app has done is allow us to think more about rendering stuff on the client side. Uh, we've switched out tags for curly braces on the wire, and we're now sending you know, far more kind of data-centric uh, material over the wire and then getting the, 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 the device to actually render uh, a view from that. And it will be interesting to see whether we can reuse some of that infrastructure that we've created uh, to go back and revisit some of the, the, the web approaches that we've used in the past and start doing more uh, client-side uh, rendering on, uh, on web apps, too. So anyway, uh, all of that's a, a long way of saying sorry for the churn. Sorry that we are apparently uh, you know, throwing all of our toys out the basket and upsetting the HTML5 community. But I do believe, and I know I'm not alone, that you know, every technology goes through a hype curve of some sort. And uh, HTML5 is no different. We are on this hype curve where everybody gets excited about something, and then they realize it isn't quite as good as they thought it was, and then it gradually it becomes adopted. And there are various names that I can't remember for each part of these, uh, uh, this, this curve. But I don't know where HTML5 is on that curve. Um, depends how controversial I want to be. It's certainly over the top. It's some way down the other side. Um, but you know what? In a way, that's a good thing, because it means that people are asking critical questions about what this new stack can do. It means that people are critically addressing the challenges that it needs to overcome in order for it to become the long-term success we all want it to be. You can have as many shiny demos as you want to get up the left-hand side, but at the end of the day, if it's going to be a successful business medium, we need to understand how to solve the problems and get through that trough of despair, I think that's what it's called, uh, onto some uh, longer-term success. 
So I don't see HTML5 as necessarily this vanquishing inevitability, but I do think we need to figure out how to climb the hill. And I think to get there, there are three obvious and big challenges which we all have to solve collectively. Uh, and since as long as I've been working in the web, these have been the same kind of problems that we've always dealt with. You know, what are the capabilities of the runtime that we're hoping to create our applications on? You know, how are we going to get it distributed so that people know where they are and you know, can choose our app over someone else's? And how can we make money out of them? Uh, and frankly, unless you are building those shiny little demos, you know, as a developer, you're thinking about all of these things before you even open an IDE. You know, if you're going to try and build a business out of your craft, you need to think about these things and have some uh, ideas about how to solve them. So let's start with the capabilities. So you know, this is obviously the cool bit, and a lot of the conference uh, today, or yesterday and today, you know, is about cool new stuff you can do, new tags, new JavaScript APIs, and, and shiny CSS calls. And uh, that's all wonderful. Look, I can blur an image in a browser. Um, but all of this demo-worthy HTML5 goodness does come with a darker side. And in fact, there are two dark sides. One is that you know, there's a standardization, standardization process. You want to use this cool stuff in the real world, you need to be able to understand how to uh, you know, watch as, as that technology comes through the standardization process, gaining and losing prefix, prefixes as it goes. And secondly, you are still entirely at the whim of what the browsers can do. It is very, very hard to polyfill certain things above and beyond what the browser ultimately allows you to support. So the tidal pull and push of what web standards uh, permit you to do and what browsers permit you to do is what our little developer boats bob about on. And it's always been like this. So you know, regardless of any snapshot in the web's history, if you were to look at the percentage of support for some given new set of capabilities, you know, there is always going to be some, on the right-hand side, some amazing new set of things you want to use which are not supported by anything. And on the left-hand side, there's always some really base, you know, commoditized basic information that is supported by pretty much everything. And as a web developer, you've got to decide where you want to live your life. You know, do you want to do stuff that's supported by everybody and have a nice, easy life? Or do you want to try and really, uh, you know, push yourself off to the right-hand side, uh, polyfilling as you go? Um, and by the way, it's always been like this. This is not a function of today. Um, there's, you know, the web has always been like this since there was more than one browser. Um, and there's this kind of pain zone in the middle, which is where you'd love to use something, and it's more or less getting standardized, and it's more or less something you're going to be able to use competently. But not everything quite supports it. Ah! And in mobile, this is a particularly painful zone, simply because there are so many different devices. There are so many different you know, screen sizes and types of support. Um, and this is the pain zone for developers. Um, I, in fact, I think we should call it the rage guy zone. This is where developers have a bad day, uh, because something you were hoping to use isn't working reliably and consistently. So the question is, how can we rein this in? How can we you know, get a better understanding of what diversity is? How can we shorten the time it takes for diverse capabilities to come to a broad market? And how can we make sure that browser vendors are working on the things that, as developers, we really care about? Uh, so this is uh, kind of a, a background story to why uh, we, uh, with a bunch of other companies, got involved with an initiative called CoreMob. Um, so the W3C, as I'm sure you're aware, has a standardization process, and it also has a community group process where you know, interested parties can get together and discuss standardization and try to move agendas forward. Um, so we created the Core Mobile Web Platform Group back in uh, May? No, March. March of this year. And uh, this is now the, the W3C's largest community group. And it is an opportunity for companies from around the mobile and web, general web space, to come together and think about what really needs to be addressed. What are the priorities for developers in terms of the capabilities that are required? Um, and it really has uh, an agenda with three parts to it. One is to agree on the core features that developers need and can, will have to depend upon in order to be successful uh, in this new medium. Secondly, to compile you know, test suites and create test suites that allow us to see which browsers are, in fact, giving us what we need as developers. And thirdly, identify you know, a, a framework by which we can actually prove that those prioritizations were correct. Um, and let me just talk a little bit about how that, how that works. Uh, but one of the things that we produced as part of this initiative was a test suite uh, called Ringmark, uh, which we developed in uh, conjunction with the community, in conjunction with uh, Buku, actually. And uh, Ringmark, which you know, runs on rng.io, is uh, a little bit like the, uh, the old ACID tests or SunSpider tests, a chance for you to see how well a browser ranks against these uh, kind of capabilities that we expect. 
And uh, what we've done is chosen specifications and prioritized these specifications according to what we think the web needs to compete with native platforms. This is an important point. So ring zero, which is kind of a snapshot of where we are, is, you know, okay, do you have some baseline stuff that a runtime ought to be able to provide you? Do you have app cache so you can take this stuff offline? Do you have geolocation? Can you show video? Um, can you store data in, in, in reasonable amounts offline? And, uh, you know, can you use Canvas for, for, for improved drawing performance? And pretty much most devices on the market, mobile devices um, that we all know and love, are in ring zero. That's more of a kind of a snapshot of a current state than anything else. Ring one, on the other hand, is what we have uh, judged to be the features that would be required if you wanted to rebuild 80% of the world's native apps in web technology. I'm not saying anyone wants to do that. But it is a good way of knowing that you've got the right capabilities put into the browsers. So you, know, you want to compete with native apps, you need to have accelerated canvas. You, know, you need to have uh, your GPU on your side. You need to have DRM to be able to do music apps. You need to have better handling of fonts and you know, be able to track history and store more data and you know, get better touch event control and so forth. Because I tell you what, native developers will have this and they take it for granted. It's like table stakes. Um, so you know, these are things that the web still aspires to have in many cases, or browsers still aspire to provide. Uh, but which developers ought to just have to be able to do their jobs. Um, and we actually, pain, rather painstakingly, went through a list of the top 100 apps in both the Apple App Store and the Android Marketplace, or Android Play, <clears throat> and we looked at each and every app, and we figured out that if we had these extra capabilities, plus some others I haven't listed, uh, you would be able to match 80% of those native apps on the web runtime, and that would be an important step forward. Um, being able to get access to the camera, wouldn't that be wonderful? Uh, and then ring two, which is kind of like an aspiration for what would happen after that, is where we start to push the boundary a little bit and say, look, there are some pretty uh, amazing specifications coming down the line, whether it's WebGL, which hasn't hit mobile quite so much yet, um, you know, streaming, audio APIs, WebSockets, SVG, et cetera. You know, and, and pretty much if with, with the suite of APIs that HTML5 promises in the, in the grander scheme of things, you have theoretical parity with pretty much uh, any native app. I think. Um, so, you know, obviously this is designed to be a catalyst. It's designed, I suppose, to be a bit of gamification of uh, the browser space, particularly in mobile. And it's about trying to push the agenda on and make sure developers' voices are being heard. And in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, we saw the first browser reach Ring 1. It's not Android, it's not Safari, it's not Chrome, sadly enough, although of course those are all improving. Um, but it is a browser called uh, Dolphin, and it's a you know, an installable browser for Android, which now passes Ring 1, and actually does rather well on Ring 2 as well. So, you know, of course it's easy to optimize a browser simply to pass tests, and, you know, the cynic in me might say, well, that's exactly what they've done here. But you know what? It's, it's, it's demonstrating that this stuff can be done. It's not impossible. Uh, yes, some of these specifications are still a little bit wobbly, but, you know, it is possible to build stuff that developers can now create pretty compelling apps on. Uh, and of course, we want to make sure that the knowledge about what these different browsers can and cannot do is getting back out to developers. And there's no point us reinventing that wheel. So we've hooked all of the test results into BrowserScope. I'm sure you've, you know, you're all familiar with BrowserScope. Um, and so there's a ring mark section in here where you can see how different browsers are doing against the different rings to give you a sense of which of those runtimes are going to be ready for you to build rich, client-side, native-ish style applications. Because you know what, you know, if you're building a camera application, a photo sharing application, and you don't have access to the camera, you just don't have an application. You know, if you're building a music app and you don't have access to audio APIs, you don't have an app. Uh, if you're building a game, but you don't have accelerated canvas or WebGL or even the ability to lock the damn rotation, you don't actually have a game. So we get very excited about things like graceful degradation and progressive enhancement, and that's all wonderful, and there are unicorns and flowers in the meadow and everything. But actually, we do ourselves a disservice. We've got to stand up and say, no, you know what? We have to have this capability. Otherwise, there's nothing progressive or graceful about going out of business. So that's what that group is all about. And the good news is that 2012 has really seen stuff moving along at a decent pace. So I uh, did some uh, sessions earlier in the year where I was talking about device APIs. It's something close to my heart. You know, there are so many things that a mobile device can do that the browser should be able to give us access to such as the camera, such as uh, the vibrator and the sensor and the various other capabilities that are on the OS around the browser. 
And uh, you know, this list was looking pretty sparse at the beginning of the year in terms of browser support, but it's actually now moving at a reasonable pace. Uh, we have got, and we actually had at the end of last year, uh, camera support through the uh, input type equals file uh, format in uh, Android. Uh, but that, just with iOS 6, has landed on the iPhone and iPad 2. So you can now actually upload a photo from the camera. Yay! You know, this is a big step forward. Uh, it might sound like a trivial little demo, but you know what? We put that straight into the Facebook app. Because we were getting, I don't know how many bug reports a day from users saying, I can't upload a picture in my Facebook app. Well, of course, they were using the web app, which just happens to look exactly the same, except that button had to go missing because we couldn't wire it up to the camera or to the gallery. So thankfully, we were finally able to put that back that button back in to the m.facebook version of the app, and now our users are cheerfully uploading images from their iPhone through the browser. So that's been a huge win for us in particular. And of course, any of you that want to build social photo apps of any sort uh, now have that as a, an API that you can use. Pretty exciting. Um, but really, I mean, the, the granddaddy of media APIs that I am most excited about, uh, and any of you that aren't familiar with it, you know, keep an eye on this because it's pretty cool, uh, is Get User Media. And Get User Media is obviously uh, a, a richer way of getting access to audio or video streams coming in off the camera or the microphone of a device. The spec is uh, moving around a little bit, but it's kind of getting there. And uh, we now have a fairly straightforward API, a fairly easy to use API that gets you access to the camera and the video. Uh, it landed in Opera in around spring, I think, with Opera 12 on mobile. And it's now in Chrome and Firefox nightly since, I think, July. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't actually know about Internet Explorer, but. Anyway, um, Get User Media is, uh, is a pretty exciting thing. And of course, this now opens up a whole lot of new web apps that use this real-time communication. So it's, the Get User Media spec is part of WebRTC. Um, and so I had built a little demo earlier in the year of uh, you know, basically a photo sharing app. And uh, you know, it only ran on Opera 12. And now it runs on three different browsers, which is a big step forward for me and for my demos. Um, but Something else I wanted to say about this little app that I built, it's sitting on uh, uh, GitHub somewhere. Uh, it's like 96 lines of code. So, you know, when I talk about trying to get the mojo back for the, for the web, you know, there aren't that many platforms in the world where you can build a fairly comprehensive photo app in 96 lines of code. Uh, but with all the markup and the CSS and the JavaScript required to build a photo app, you know, it actually turned out to be pretty elegant in the end. Um, and once we see that roll out to more browsers, that'll be very exciting. Uh, so whilst we're talking about capabilities, I should talk about performance. Um, this is kind of like another one of those elephants in the room when it comes to web, uh, uh, particularly versus native. As I said, when we upgraded our app from web to native, we increased the performance by two times, and we increased content consumption by two times. Those two things are entirely correlated. And pixel by pixel, users can barely tell the difference between the two apps. So it was performance that was the forcing function for that increase in engagement. So I don't think it takes too much as a thought experiment to think, well, hang on, if the browser had been twice as performant, and if the scrolling had been twice as fast, we wouldn't have had to have left HTML5 at all. We would have still got our goal, which is to have twice as much content consumed. We had to go and rebuild the entire thing from scratch. If the browser had gotten twice, and far, twice as fast, we would have had the same end result. So, it turns out that performance is really, really important. We can't keep burying our heads in the sand and saying, yes, OK, so I know, I know the frame rates are crappy, and I know the scrolling's really bad, but don't worry. You have to worry, because it does make a huge difference. Users deeply, deeply care about this stuff. Uh, so when someone says, you know, you don't sacrifice x for performance, they're wrong. You don't sacrifice anything for, for performance. Um, so clearly, performance is a major issue that we need to keep working on. And sadly, it's just one of those things you can't really codify and make empirical for the purposes of standardization. You know, performance is a feature, but you don't ever hear someone say, oh, it should scroll like butter in a W3C spec. But that's what users expect, and that's what they're going to use to judge whether the app you created was good or bad, uh, not whether you use tags or curly brackets. Uh, so I'm no Steve Souders, but of course, you know, we, ha we, we have lots of ways that we can make web apps run faster and more smoothly. It is pretty hard, though. I mean, we had to put a lot of developer effort into making stuff performant. And uh, you know, my dirty secret this year is that I have been building some iOS apps. I'm very sorry about that. Um, you know, I feel guilty bringing Objective-C to an HTML5 conference. But you, you, you can't make it not fast. <laughs> it just is always going to scroll like butter. It's really hard to make an iOS app not look beautiful and not scroll wonderfully. But on the web, 
ah, oh, you have to put up so much effort into it. So, you know, if we're prepared to continue to take that effort on ourselves, then great. But I'd actually rather see the runtimes up their game and improve the performance there. Uh, <clears throat> finally, I mean, if we want HTML5 to be thought of as a fully fledged tech stack that can stand up against uh, the competition, we have to have documentation that goes with it. And I'm sure uh, you're all aware, uh, if I, I'm sure I'm not the first person to mention it, but there is a, now a fantastic site out on the web called webplatform.org, uh, which is going to be the canonical, well, it's already really, uh, the canonical source for all of the web stack information and content that you as developers need, whether it's JavaScript, CSS, HTML, HTTP, and, and various other kind of metadata standards. So uh, we were actually uh, small and very humble contributors to the kickoff of webplatform.org last week, and I guarantee that is going to be an essential piece of kit for us to get our mojo back and become a community that knows what it is doing in a canonical way. I uh, just wanted to finish off quickly with a, you know, a couple of words about the second two here. I know this is not really a business conference. We're not here to talk about monetization and so forth. But um, it, it is worth remembering that this is the reason why a lot of people go down a native route. It's not because they prefer writing Objective-C or Java. It's because they can't see how to make money and get people to use their apps if they build them with HTML5. Um, so unless we're happy for HTML5 to be a hobby of shiny little demos, we have to figure out how to get it to keep the lights on as businesses. Um, so one of my colleagues, uh, Simon Cross, was at the PhoneGap Day in Amsterdam last uh, month. And I'm sure you're all familiar with PhoneGap. It's a way of wrapping you know, your web assets into a native wrapper. And it provides some device APIs, and it provides push notification capabilities and payments, and allows you to publish your app to the App Store. And he asked the attendees at that conference, what of those four was the reason that they chose to put their apps into PhoneGap? And the answer, of course, is D. 90% of the people who use PhoneGap do not use device APIs, do not use push notifications, and do not even use the payments capabilities that are now available. They do it simply to get their web assets into the App Store. So that should make you, you know, stroke your chin and think a little bit, wait a minute. You know, PhoneGap was not designed to be a monetization framework, but actually, it's, it, it, or a distribution framework, but that's exactly what it is. Uh, people don't actually use the device APIs very much. They're just told by their boss to get it into the App Store, so they think, okay, I'll chuck it in PhoneGap. Um, you know, why, why, why are they choosing PhoneGap? It's either to get distribution or it's because your boss said so. Well, I can't fix B, but I can fix A, and if we fix A, then B will take care of itself. Um, there is this assumption, perhaps amongst non-technologists, that just the App Store is just where everything has to be. It's where the CEO expects to find his company's app, or it's where the client expects to find their newest campaign. As technologists, that may make us rip our hair out and go, ah! Uh, but anyway, you know, let's, let's do what they want, because they pay the bills, and you know, let's get it out there. So PhoneGap is fantastic. I love it. Uh, but is that the only way that we can make ourselves heard? Is that the only way we can get our assets out into the real world? I hope not. Um, and I know this presentation isn't necessarily about Facebook, but I ought to mention that we do have a billion users. And uh, we have 600 million of those on mobile active every month. And another number, which we don't publish, but is also extremely high, who only use Facebook on mobile. That is the amazing number. And that is rising the fastest of all of them. So we have an incredible population who are only looking at their mobile device for their daily uh, web experience and for their daily uh, social experiences. And that is a huge opportunity. Because if they're seeing stories that are being told by their friends, if they're seeing the apps that are being used by their friends, that is actually a very powerful way for them to discover your applications. Um, and I think it's, a, it's not a replacement, but it's an augmentation of, of how you can get your app discovered, not just in an app store, but also through seeing people's friends using it. Um, and the background to this theory, by the way, this is not Facebook specific, this is, this is a trend we're seeing generally, you know, is that the web used to be this anonymous mesh of documents all linked together with hyperlinks, you know, very, very flat, and everybody had exactly the same experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And you had to go looking for stuff. You had to go and pull content out of this web. You had to know what it was you were looking for first. Um, and your life pretty much began every day with one of these. Okay, this was how your day started. Oh, a box. Let me think. I'm going to go and look at the news. Let me type in news. Or, oh, maybe something happened in Iraq. I'm going to type Iraq into a search box. You know, that's how you navigated the web. Um, but this decade of the web is more about something that's oriented around you as a person, where you sort of expect to have content pushed to you. 
You know, you find it ambiently on Twitter, or you find it in your Facebook newsfeed, or I don't know, do people still use RSS? You find stuff kind of ambiently pushed towards you, and it's, pers it's personalized, it's socialized. You know, the content you see on the web is going to be different for you than it is from the guy next to you. So really, that gives us an opportunity to answer people's questions like this. You know, what apps do my friends use? Not just which apps can I find in that goddamn app store categorized in some bizarre way. Um, and so, you know, without wanting to bang on the drum too much, but that's kind of what we think Facebook can do to help uh, developers if they can build compelling social apps that people like to use and people like to use to tell stories to their friends. Um, that is another way for your name and your app to get out there. Uh, to the extent that we now, of course, have a, an app center of our own uh, where we list out the apps that we know are running against Facebook and which we know uh, will, uh, you know, users are being, uh, users are using and which apps your friends are using and so forth. And the important thing to note here is that this app store has native apps in it, has Android apps, has iOS apps, but it also have mo has mobile web apps. They are all on par. Users don't know which ones they're looking at. They don't know how they were built. It's just apps as far as users are concerned. So if you're an HTML5 developer and you want to monetize your app, you now have an opportunity to sell it in an app store. You now have an opportunity to do in-app payments. You now have an opportunity uh, to uh, you know, uh, build a business out of this stack. Um, so we'll, we hope we're helping in some way there. So look, it may be possible to argue <clears throat> and I don't know, hopefully I can, we can prove history wrong, um, that the web was really just an anomaly. It might not be this inevitable thing that lives on forever and ever. It might just be that the web was a thing that happened at the end of the PC era, and which the mobile web, or the mobile era rather, just completely dispensed with. Uh, we never needed the web from now on. Um, and uh, you know, if the web is just going to be a dusty bookshelf of anonymous documents, then then it probably will just die in the same way that libraries die. Uh, they're there, they serve a purpose, but it's not really where people spend most of their lives anymore. Um, so what I hope is that the web can be lifted out of that. It can be, you know, it can be uh, more than a bookshelf, and it can become an, an operating system. You know, the web, HTML5, provides us the opportunity to run rich and compelling applications uh, that stand on their own two feet and which are not out of their depth with respect to their native brethren. Um, I think the web has an exciting new opportunity. Of course, it is up to us. It is up to you to go and prove that I'm not talking rubbish and uh, that there is innovation and there are ideas and there is a desire to push things forward. And I hope that by doing that, by demonstrating what we can do, and by continuing to lobby uh, the runtime environments to improve, uh, we can get there. Um, at every conference like this, someone stands up and says, oh, well, of course, you know, the radio was supplanted by the TV, and the TV was supplanted by you know, the internet, and you know, we spent the transitions from one era to the next trying to apply the old cliches to the new world. Uh, and certainly, I do see a lot of that. I see people taking old web thinking and just trying to splat it onto mobile. We have to think bigger than that. You know, we have to think that the, uh, that the web of the next decade is going to be this amazing, rich, compelling place with devices that support all the capabilities that we need, uh, innovative beautiful, disruptive, like this dream we had 15 years ago. Um, let's unencumber ourselves from our desktop dogma and uh, figure out how to embrace and get excited about these new opportunities and uh, make HTML5 a better and more ambitious place. Thank you very much.